chapter 2, if you, not, if you have not already done so, Malachi 2. You know, a lot of times when life becomes difficult, what happens is, and if things aren't going the way we plan, you know, we have a plan in mind. We think things should go a certain way. When they don't go that way, it's what's, what happens often is it's easy for us to let a worldly philosophy, philosophy and worldly thinking enter into our heads, and we figure, well, God's not being fair to us. You know, things aren't happening the way I imagine they would, the way I would like them to happen. So therefore, God's not being fair to us. And we have our circumstances tend to dominate us in such a time. And we begin to think of the Lord in a more negative light. Has that ever happened to you? Don't raise your hands. So that probably happened to most everybody. Once or twice or maybe several times. Things aren't going your way, and so you, you think, well, what's, what, why is the Lord doing this to me? And we kind of place the blame on him. It must be his fault, after all, that this is happening to me. And, you know, why isn't he governing the world the way I think he should? Why isn't he doing things the way I think he should? And so we begin to form theological opinions in our head about God. And, 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 the, and our, th- our, th- our thoughts often turn into words, and then we speak those words in front of people, and we influence them with our worldly philosophy that we've adopted, and we develop a self-righteous attitude, as if we're wiser than God. We have a better plan than God. God's plan is not doing so well. Let me come in and help him out. That's what happened in Malachi's day. They, things weren't going the way they wanted. Uh, God was not living up to their expectations. They thought they deserved better than God was uh, allowing them to live. And, they, and so their thoughts turned into words, and they begin to make statements. You have to understand, they begin to make theological statements. They, statements about God, except their statements were an error. Their statements were biblically incorrect. In fact, they were blasphemous. And as we've seen already in this book, they showed their statements, the words they said showed that they had a low view, a weak view of God. But in this passage here, the Lord will answer them. He will answer their statements of blasphemy. And he will show them, yes, I do indeed govern the universe, and I have a plan for the future. And I, there's going to be justice that's going to come down, not the way you want it to, or the way you expect it, but there will be justice. Now, the outline tonight is very simple. And uh, if I can do one thing as Spurgeon did, and only one thing, I can announce the outline at the beginning of a sermon. He did that, usually. That's the only thing I can do he did. Outline is very simple. Number one, the people's accusations, and number two, the Lord's answer. Let's start with the people's accusations, First chapter 2, verse 17. Malachi says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him? And that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or you also say this, Where is the God of justice? Now, throughout this book, the people, if you've been following the people have been questioning God. They've been questioning his goodness. God, yes, God had been good to them in many ways, but they were spiritually blind. Many of them were. Not all of them were. We'll see that in chapter, later on in chapter 3. A lot of them were spiritually blind, and they questioned his goodness. If you recall in chapter 1, they questioned his love. Remember that in chapter 1, verse 2? The Lord says, I have loved you, but instead of Israel accepting what the word of God says, they cast down on his love, and they, their answer was, how have you loved us? You say you love this? How is this? In verse 6 of chapter 1, the Lord says to the priests who are offering defective sacrifices, sacrifices that are uh, not the kind the Lord said to offer in his word, he says, you have despised my name, you people. And like children who talk back to their parents, and that's what I'm reminded of, they say to the Lord, how have we despised your name? They're questioning God. Chapter 2, verse 13, the Lord says, I'll no longer accept your offerings. And in verse 14, they say, for what reason? To talk back to God like that, amazing. They'd rather argue with the Lord than repent. What they should have said is, yes, Lord, you're righteous. I'm wrong. I'm wicked. I'm sinful. I've done the wrong thing. I've said the wrong thing. We're going to turn from our evil thoughts. We're going to turn from our evil deeds. We're going to turn from our, our, the evil that we're committing, and we're going to walk in obedience to your word. That's what they should have said. If they don't do that, in fact, they continue to question God. And again, we go to chapter 2, verse 17, and there they say this. You have, Malachi says, you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how? 
How have we wearied him? The word wearied means here, and it's used twice, it's, it's got to do with physical, physical exhaustion due to strenuous labor. Someone has worked really hard. At the end of the day, they're very tired. And it says here, the Lord is wearied with the words he's hearing from these people. Basically, the Lord is telling them, you people absolutely wear me out by what you're saying about me. It's just getting really old. You're wearing me out. It's exhausting. Now, let me ask you a question. Can the Lord be physically and emotionally exhausted? Is that possible? He can be weary to the point that he is exhausted. Can he become weary? Now, it's true he governs the entire universe. That's quite a job, especially with people like us. And, but, you know, they say the toughest uh, job in the uh, world is the job of the president, world's toughest job. I can believe that because of all the things, all the countries to deal with. Our country and all the things you have to go through, all that. But how would you like to be sovereign over all creation? You're sovereign over all creation or God's sovereign over all creation. That wearies me just thinking about it. But does the Lord get physically and mentally drained from his work? Well, Isaiah has the answer. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 says this. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. He does not become weary or tired. In fact, it goes on to say he gives strength to even the youth. The young men are falling, and they can't seem to, and they're stumbling. They can't even keep on, uh, up on their feet, and, and he gives strength to them even. Now, since we know that the Lord is a source of inexhaustible energy, inexhaustible strength, he never needs a rest. Think about this. God, we, we can't think about this because we get tired, right? He never needs to rest. He never needs a vacation. He never needs a break of any kind. Um, and so when it says you have wearied the Lord, that must be taken in the sense of a metaphor, kind of like a word picture. It's a way to say, you know, what you people are saying about God is really getting old. It's getting tiring listening to all this. It's ridiculous what you're saying. It's absurd. It's blasphemous. And God's patience is about to come to an end with all this. What were they saying? Well, they made two statements, verse 17, both of them theological statements. Do you know that people make theological statements? I say theological statements, statements about God. They make statements about God all the time. You hear people saying, you know, when you talk to people, they like to say God is loving. They all like to say that one, right? God is loving, by which they mean God is never a God of judgment. He's only loving. He would never judge anybody, which shows me they've never even begun to read the Bible at all. Because both are true. God's loving in, and he's a, God, a, he's a judge. So people make these statements. They make statements about the person and work of the Lord. They may, these statements may be accurate. They may not be, depending on what they say. Even unbelievers make theological statements, statements about God. Now, many statements that are made are purely a product of our own sinful minds. It just comes out, and we say something that, Maybe our, from our background, our parents said to us, some spiritual leader, spiritual guru said to us, or they heard in a sermon somewhere, we came up with it out of our own brain, our own theology. I remember a guy I worked with, and I tried to witness to him, and he kept saying one thing. When I was a kid, when I was 14, I had a dream that the world would end in the year 2000. This is before 2000, obviously. Now, what if he would have had that dream after the year 2000? And that's all I could get out of that guy. And he was influenced by this the rest of his life, this so-called dream he had. People say a lot of strange things. So what comes out of their mouth often about God is distorted. It's confused. It's irreverent. It's heretical even. Now, how do we know whether a statement someone makes about God is true or not? How do you know when someone says a statement about God, God is this? How do you know whether it's true or not? Well, we ask this question. Does it agree with the Word of God? Test it against the Scripture. Does it line up with the doctrines of the Word of God? That's how you know. If, if the lines up with the Scripture, you're good to go. If it, if it goes against the Scripture, you've got a problem on your hands, with God, at least. That's how you know. The people in chapter 2, verse 17, they make two theological statements. When we examine these two statements in the light of the Scripture, we find out this. They're both heretical. They're both wrong. Statement number one, they say in verse 17, everyone, this is what the people were saying in Malachi's time. Some of the people, a certain amount of people, we don't know how many. Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and, and God delights in them. Now think about that for a minute. Does that sound like something the Lord's in favor of? 
Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. To me, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds blasphemous. That's right, it does. The people apparently think of themselves as having a higher standard of holiness than God himself. Well, if God was just as holy as I was, he would see to it that we would take care of the evil in this world. You know, in their view, God was doing nothing about evil, in their view, at least. He must be approving of it then. If he's doing nothing about it, he must approve of it. In fact, he must take delight in evil people. He must like those people as well. And it shows what a new low the people had come to. This is after the exile. And they don't know, they don't know that there's just a few white pages between them and Matthew. <laughs> About 400 years down the road, that things are going to change drastically here. At the end of the Old Testament, how could anybody at this time period think that God condones evil? Or that God could approve of evil? Or that God could approve of people who do evil. How could he do this? The whole Bible, they should have known. The whole Bible was a witness against that. Of course, their spiritual leadership didn't help them out much either, I might say. I might add. Again and again, though, the scriptures emphasize the holiness of God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, immediately God pronounced his judgment against them. In Genesis 6, chapter 6, it says this. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is what he saw, and so grieved was he, he decided to blot out mankind from the face of the earth. And he sends the flood. That's the holiness of God. Habakkuk said of the Lord, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. Your eyes are too pure to even behold evil. If God's too pure to behold evil, how is it he approves of those who do evil? That would be ridiculous. Even when his own son, Jesus, died on the cross, the Lord said, he's bearing the sin, he's bearing sin on the cross, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God's wrath was being poured out on Jesus because of sin. He took our sin upon himself. That's why he died on the cross. He rose again. That's why, and he came to be our savior. God hates sin. Beyond any, beyond, far beyond any, what any of us can even imagine. Now, we're, we can't even imagine this because we don't hate sin anywhere near to that degree. But he does. He hates sin. He can't stand it. He hates it. We've already seen in Malachi how unholy these people are. Who are they to stand in judgment of God's holiness? Who do they think they are? And yet they have this self-righteous gall to question God's holiness. Second statement, statement number two, they said in verse 17, chapter 2, they were saying, where is the God of justice? You ever heard that before? You ever heard statements similar to that before? That people make, it's an old argument. It's like the psalmist said occasionally, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Why do these things happen? God's not very fair. God's not just. Now, yes, they had their share of trials. I, I get it. The people had their share of trials and difficulties. In post-exilic Judah, this is... After they'd gone through Babylon for seven years, they come back to the land, and now they're, they're back in the land. They're having difficulties when they got started, but God gets them on the road to recovery, and they're going down the road. But they're losing their desire and interest to serve the Lord, and so they're having their share of difficulties. But whose fault was that? They brought the trouble on themselves. They, they have always done this throughout the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, I, I was reminded of Nehemiah chapter 9. Do you remember in Nehemiah 9, when we talked about this, the Levites were praying a prayer publicly, and they say in chapter 9, verse 32, the Levites prayed this, Now therefore, our God, do not let all the hardship, all the hardship, seem insignificant before you which has come upon us. We've suffered a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulties. Don't let that seem insignificant to us. From the days of Assyria, the Assyrians deported certain people out of the country. To this day, we have suffered hardship. But then they continue in their prayer. However, they say, you are just. You are just. In all that has come upon us, you are just. For you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. That's the actual truth of the matter right there. That's what the people in Malachi's day couldn't see. The people in Nehemiah's day, not all that much earlier, saw that they were the evil ones. God was just. Is God just? 
Well, this is the same God who set the standard for justice in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, for, for, that, for, for example, the judges of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 16, 19, he says to the judges of Israel, the judges in court cases and so on, he said, you shall not distort justice, you shall not be partial, you shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and it perverts the words of the righteous. To the judges, he says, I want you guys to be just in your decisions that you make. Isaiah 30, verse 18 says, for the Lord is a God of justice. <clears throat> the Lord is a God of justice. Micah 6, 8 teaches that God takes delight when justice is actually carried out. He delights in that. But here in Malachi, people are questioning God's character, questioning God's ways. They're always doing this. People are always doing this to this day. They cast doubt on his promises. They malign his character. They question his faithfulness. All these things. Let me tell you some advice here. Be careful of harboring evil thoughts about God in your mind, first of all. Be careful of harboring thoughts that are irreverential about God in your mind, not glorifying Him. Be careful of making statements that degrade Him because things aren't going well for you. Be careful of making statements that degrade His character or cast doubt on His, per his person because God is perfectly holy and just. So the people accuse God of, saying, of, of these things. Where is the God of justice, they say? And then the Lord answers in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. He answers them. Let's read that section again. As the way, by way of his answer, he says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> but who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages. I will... Uh, be, I will judge the widow, those who would dare uh, hinder the widow and the orphan, those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. All these things. Now, unfortunately, there's a chapter division created being ch between chapter 2, verse 17, and chapter 3, verse 1. That is not part of the inspired scripture. The verses and the chapters not part of the inspired scripture. That was done back in the 1300s, 1200s, whatever. Ignore that. A lot of times they get it right. Sometimes they don't, as in here. The context of chapter 2, 17 continues into chapter 3. The accusations leveled against the Lord in the 2, 17 are answered in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, some say 1 to 6. The answer will involve four prophecies. Four prophecies. The, four, the first prophecy will involve the Lord's forerunner. The Lord's forerunner. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Now let's go back to Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. Malachi 1.1 1, 1. says here the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. The name Malachi means my messenger. He was the messenger of the Lord in the 5th century. Judah, as we've been reading about here. Go to chapter 2, verse 7. It talks about the Levitical priest. It says, for the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge and men should seek instruction from his mouth for he is what? He's the messenger of the Lord of hosts, twice already. Now we have another messenger. It says here, behold, I'm going to send my messenger. Is that Malachi? No. Levitical priest of chapter 2, no. The speaker, notice here the speaker who's saying this refers to himself as I in the first sentence. Behold, I, I'm going to send my messenger. At the end of the verse, still speaking, he refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. This is the same one mentioned several times in Malachi already as the Lord of hosts. It's been called that several times in this book. This one is God, who's also called the Father in chapter 2, verse 10. God says, I'm going to send my messenger. Who's my messenger? By the way, offering a disclaimer for the rest of this chapter. Not an easy chapter, in my opinion. Who's my messenger? Well, the, his job description is, description is given. 
chapter 3, verse 1, it says, I'm going to send my messenger. What's he going to do? He's going to clear the way before me. He's going to clear the way before me. Now, there was a custom in ancient times back in the day. When a king was coming to an area to visit, messengers would go before that king, and they would prepare the way. They would tell the people of a given town, hey, the king is coming. You guys need to get your act together like we're a white glove inspection. Let's, let's shape up. Let's get this thing together over here. Uh, let's, you know, they would pave the way. If there's any obstacles in the way on the road, they'd make sure those were removed to make it passable for the king. Get those stones out of the way. The king is coming through. The messenger is going in advance to the king to make a way for him, prepare the way for him. Now, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 makes reference to this as well. Isaiah 40, verse 3 says this, A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground be made a plain, become a plain, the rugged terrain a broad valley. road has to be level for the king to come through. Now, if you've read the Gospels, You know who this is. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We can look at other references as well. Mark 1, verse 1. Say, I haven't been reading the Bible. Here, let me start you on the Gospel of Mark. Mark 1, verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Tell me if you've heard this before. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, all the people of Jerusalem. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. His diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, after me, one is coming who is mightier than I. I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Now, as you read this, you find out who the Lord's messenger is. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is going to prepare the way. Mark 1 1 quotes Malachi 3.1 in verse 2. Quoting the verse we just read. And he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3 and verse 3. So we know the references to John the Baptist in this first sentence here of Malachi 3.1. John prepared the way for Jesus when Jesus was coming on the scene. He prepared his way. That was the job assigned to him by the Lord. Now, how did he prepare the way? He preaches a baptism of repentance. He says, people, you need to repent. The Lord is coming. The Messiah is coming. Get ready for him. He told them to turn away from their sin and turn to God. That was no mere emotional or intellectual experience, by the way. Repentance shows itself by your life, how you're living. It was evidenced by a change of life. In fact, in Matthew 3, 7, John the Baptist, it says, when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You want to show you're for real? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You want to show that this is real repentance? Show me by your life that it's changed. John is preparing the way for Jesus in a spiritual sense. He's clearing the way for him spiritually. He said, there's someone coming whose sandals I'm not even worried to, I'm not even worthy to untie. Not even worthy to bend over and, and do that. John's ministry, his whole ministry pointed to the Messiah, Jesus. John had a unique ministry at a unique time in history as the Lord's forerunner. That's the first prophecy, the Lord's forerunner. There's a second prophecy in Malachi 3. That is the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I am going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, since the phrase, my messenger, in Malachi 3, 1, is talking about John the Baptist, the next phrase follows. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come must refer to the Messiah, Jesus. That is the one whom John prepared the way for. But who is the the messenger of the covenant? Very interesting phrase. I'm I'm seeing the words in my mind all week, messenger of the covenant, messenger of the covenant. 
It's been staying with me constantly. Uh, and I still don't understand everything about the phrase, messenger of the covenant. But who is it? Well, it's also a reference to Jesus. The statement, look at the statement, the Lord whom you seek, is parallel to the statement, the messenger of the covenant, referring to one and the same person. Let me say this also. Charles Feinberg, a Hebrew scholar who was, as I've said before, MacArthur's teacher in seminary, points out the following. He says, a comparative study, you've got to have backup on this one, a comparative study of the Old Testament scriptures bearing on the subject will reveal that this person, messenger of the covenant, <clears throat> is the angel of the covenant. In Exodus chapter 23, where we're talking about the Mosaic covenant then, and he's talking about the, or we call him the angel of the Lord a lot of times. The angel is God's self-revelation. He is the Lord himself, the angel of the Lord of the whole Old Testament history. The pre-incarnate Christ is the messenger of the covenant. Now, this, word, this Hebrew word translated messenger could be translated angel as well, depending on the context. It could be a human messenger or an angelic being. In this context, it is the Messiah. He is the messenger of the covenant, the Lord who, who, who's coming. <laughs> in fact, it says in the first middle part of the verse, Malachi 3, 1, he's suddenly going to come to his temple. At the end, he's coming. Same person, the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. <clears throat> Let's not miss out on Christ's deity in this verse also. Notice that the Lord of hosts is speaking of the Lord. The Lord of hosts talking talks about the Lord whom you seek. Two separate persons, both referred to as the Lord. And whenever the word Lord is preceded by the definite article, the word the, the Lord, it always refers to the Lord's divinity. Always. Talking about divine. This Lord who is coming is divine. Christ is divine. You couldn't help but think of Psalm 110.1. You've heard... That verse, and Jesus quotes the verse, Psalm 1. the Lord says to my Lord, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And in Acts 2.34, Peter quotes Psalm 110.1 and applies it to Christ, and he says, God has made him, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now, he's called the messenger of the covenant. The only one thing, it doesn't specify a particular covenant. <clears throat> and Malachi, you can take me to task later on if you want to on this one. I'm still working through it. It doesn't specify a particular covenant. And there's all kinds of talk about what the covenant means. Is he talking about the Mosaic covenant? Is he talking about the Abrahamic covenant? Is he talking about the new covenant? And it goes on and on and on. And because I'm still working through this, I'm still working through many things. By the way, let me confess this. Confession time. Did you know I'm still working through many things in the scripture? <laughs> Probably will be until the day I die. Spurgeon said, when you, you know, the scripture is like standing on the shore and looking out in the ocean, and you just, you haven't gotten anywhere. At the end of his life, he said this, I've gotten nowhere. You know, I still don't understand what's going on. A lot of things. I under, there's many things that are understandable. Don't get me wrong. The general run of the Bible is understandable. There's things that are difficult, too. Paul, Peter said of Paul, right? Some things difficult in his writing. I say that about the Old Testament prophets. I think it's best under the circumstances, for me at least, to say this. Walter Kaiser describes it this way. I'm going to go with his take right now. The covenant referred to here is the single plan of God contained in the succession of covenants. The covenant referred to here, some people aren't going to like this, is the single plan of God contained in the succession of covenants. Then he mentions the number of covenants like the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, New Covenant. It's throughout the single plan, he says, that's what he's referring to here. Now, the description messenger of the covenant <clears throat> has to do with the prophetic role Christ is going to play. His, ability, his message is going to be with authority. You remember in the, in the Gospels, did Jesus speak with authority in the Gospels, or did he just kind of wimp, wimp, wimp around and, well, I'm, I apologize for saying these things. No, you go to Matthew 23, and he calls the scribes Pharisees and hypocrites, right? He was authoritative. John 7:46 refers to Jesus, and it says, Never did a man speak the way this man speaks. Because he spoke with authority. His message was from God. He was from God, and he, what he spoke was from God, and he embodied the message himself. Not only did he say it, he embodied the message. Now, the people in Malachi's time, according to this verse, were apparently looking for the Messiah. It says, the Lord whom you seek. And then it says, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Now, this is probably spoken sarcastically in some senses. This is because I say that because the same word delight in 217, 
uh, the same word delight used in chapter 3, verse 1, rather, is the same word used in chapter 2, verse 17. The people in 2.17 says God delights in evil, in evil people, and now they're, they're going to say they delight in the messenger of the covenant, the Messiah? I, don't, I think that's strange. I think what happened was they're claiming to have delighted in his coming, in the Messiah's coming, but they didn't understand fully what that meant. They're living evil lives. They're looking for the Messiah. They want to get out of the jam they're in. They want help. They want hope to come, and they want the Messiah to come, but they didn't understand fully what that meant. They weren't taking delight in God, and if they didn't delight in the Father, how were they going to delight in the Son? We can say we're delighting in the, in, the, in the Son and the Messiah, but if we don't live that way, we have a problem. So they're, they anticipated the coming of the Messiah, but their lives and their words revealed their true spiritual condition. By the way, you can't have it both ways. You can't, have, you can't say, I delight in Christ, and then your words betray all that. You can't say, I delight in Christ, and your life, your, the deeds you do, they, it betrays all that. It's, it's one or the other. You can't do both. You can't dishonor Christ while at the same time saying, I love Christ. What kind of a twisted view of God is that? It doesn't work that way. The hope is that we would truly delight in Christ. This is something we can gain from this verse. We should truly delight in Christ. He should be our greatest delight. Our greatest joy, our greatest contentment should be found in him. We should be like Paul who said, for me to live is what? It's Christ. My very life is Christ. It's all about Christ. It's what I want to do. That's what we should be doing. But if our words and deeds are wearying to the Lord, how is it we can say, I take delight in Christ? <clears throat> the promise in Malachi to people before the New Testament times is that Messiah is coming. Behold, he is coming. In verse 1 it says, he's coming to his temple. It's a definite promise. There's a lot of things we could say about all this, but <clears throat> we can only, there's so much, there's only, like, what, two minutes left? There's not that much time. I can't say everything. It's certain he will come. Now, in verse 1, is, this, is, is verse 1 referring to Christ's first coming or second coming? <clears throat> if it seems confusing to you, it's because both comings are meant. Both Christ's first and second coming are tied up in this verse. This is one of those times in the Old Testament that the prophet speaks of the two comings of Christ together. You know, we use the old illustration, the two mountain peaks that you see out in the distance. <clears throat> you can see the two mountain peaks, but you don't see the valley between them. Malachi didn't see the, the interval, the time interval between the two, just the, the first coming and the second coming. He puts them together. The first coming has to do with John the Baptist, right? He came the first, that was the first coming as the forerunner. Now, it's often said that Christ, <clears throat> here's what people normally say. First coming has to do with salvation. Second coming have to do, has to do with judgment. That's true. But I will, I will tell you this. The first coming has to do with judgment in one sense also. Jesus said in John 9.39, just read the Gospels and tell me if you don't think that's not true. John 9.39, Jesus says, For judgment I am coming to this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. You see, the Pharisees thought they had clear spiritual vision. <clears throat> and they said, oh, we see, we, can, we understand. But they were, in fact, spiritually blind. They refused to admit they were sinful, that they were spiritually. They didn't want to admit that. And Christ says, I'm going to judge these people. This is his first coming. Whenever the truth of the gospel is revealed and rejected, guess what? Judgment begins. John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not judged. If you believe in Christ, you're not judged. If you, if you come to Christ and you repent of your sins and you turn from your sins and you take him as your Lord and Savior, you're not judged, he says. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Of course, there's the day of judgment coming to the whole world, for that matter. Now, as for the second coming, verse 1 says he's going to come suddenly. The word does not mean immediately, but it means unexpectedly or surprisingly. It's going to be an unexpected event. People aren't going to realize it. Every time that word is used in the Old Testament, except for one, it has to do with, it's connected with judgment. It's connected with disaster. 1 Thessalonians 5.2, in the New Testament, refers to this time, it says, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, here's the key, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. He's speaking of the day of the Lord. Look at Malachi 
Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? People were saying, I delight in the Lord, yet they were calling good evil and evil good. They, there's, they have much to fear, these people. But there's a third prophecy, and that has to do with the Lord's purifying in verses 2 to 4. The Lord's purifying. Look at verse 2. He says in chapter 3, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He's going to sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. <clears throat> He's going to purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present offerings to the Lord uh, in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. This is going to be... The time spoken of here is, is going to be the day of the Lord. He says, who can stand, who can endure the day of his coming? The implied answer is nobody can. Nobody can endure the day of his coming. It's going to take the Lord's grace and mercy to make him stand. Nobody can stand before him. Only, only the saved can, are going to escape this, escape judgment. The time spoken of is the day of the Lord, a period of time inaugurated by the second coming of Christ. And it's not a, one day, it's a period of time. Malachi 4.5 refers to that day as the great and terrible day of the Lord. Not a time that's going to be enjoyable. It's going to be a time of both, both a time of purifying as well as a time of judgment. Both are going to happen. Now, in verses 2 to 4, the subject concerns the Lord's purifying and refining process. Verse 2 says, when Christ comes, he'll be like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. The refining fire, the refiner's fire is a reference to the work that silversmiths did back in that day, goldsmiths did back in that day. When they determine the purity of metals, that's what we're talking about here. That's the background. Verse 3 says that he's going to sit as a smelter and purifier of fire. Here's what happened. When they were trying to see if metals were pure back in that day, the silver and goldsmiths at that time sat bending forward over their smelting pots. Smelting furnaces, they would sit there and look at it, bend forward, to ascertain from the color of the metal whether it was pure or not. And one commentator says there is a dramatic moment, listen to this, a dramatic moment when the refiner knows that all the dross has gone from the silver, peering over it, from where he's sitting, peering over the silver, the, I'm sorry, peering over it, the, the silver suddenly becomes a liquid mirror in which the image of the refiner is reflected. He sees himself in that liquid, and he says, I'm satisfied now. The task is done. Now, according to verse 2, the refiners, the refiners like fuller soap. I can't, I, sorry, Ken, I thought about you like a thousand times when I read this. Not, we're not talking about the soap that Ken Fuller uses, all right? We're talking about, although he might want to tell you what that is later on. Okay, well, we won't talk about that right now. Another subject for another day, okay? The refiner is like Fuller's soap or like a launderer's soap. Fuller's a launderer. Soap as we know it today had not yet been invented. They didn't have, you know, Dove. <laughs> you go buy a bar of soap. The soap was a cleansing agent at that time made of alkali. Obviously, the soap is used to cleanse dirt off people, but this is talking about spiritual cleansing. So you have these two metaphors used to speak of the Lord's purifying work. The Lord is going to cleanse people from sin and defilement. Now, who will he purify? Now, that's very interesting. Verse 3 says he will purify who? The sons of Levi. This isn't in the future. The day of the Lord. It says the day is coming when the Levites will be purified so they can present offerings in righteousness. They weren't doing that in Malachi's day. You remember that? Chapter one, verse, look at chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, he says to the priests, the Levites, you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. You're not doing what I want. They weren't doing that in, in, in that day. But he says, one day, you guys are going to get it right, and you're going to present the right offerings that future day. When you do it, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem is going to be pleasing to the Lord. I'm going to be pleased with this as in the days of old, back in the good old days, when maybe when David was around others, when things were going like they should, God was being worshipped like he should be worshipped. It's going to be like that in a future day. The priests in Malachi were not very pure. Their offerings were definitely not pure. But the Lord says there's a day coming when the Levites will once again offer in righteousness. They're going to be purified. 
Now think about that for a minute. There are many who look at this verse and they say, they don't take this for what it says. They say, and I've read these quotes, that, well, this is, you understand this is referring to the church. The Levites, sons of Levi, and the nation of Israel. This is not the nation of Israel and the sons of Levi. This is referring to the church that's going to happen in the New Testament. This is symbolic of the New Testament church, is what they say. There's only one problem with this. It's a lot easier, by the way, to say that. There's only one problem with that. If we take that approach, then we can throw away any logic we have in interpreting the Word of God. We throw away grammatical, historical interpretation. We throw it all away, and nothing can mean anything. Where are we left with this kind of interpretation? We have to take the words as they come. In, this, in their context, we have to interpret it that way. Now, will there be Levites in a future day? Let me ask it that way. Will there be a temple? Will there be offerings? Well, I only ask you this. What does Malachi 3, 1 to 4 say? When he comes in that future day, it says there's going to be sons of Levi are going to be purified, there's going to be a temple, offerings, so on. The answer is yes. The offerings aren't for Christ has already died, taking the sins of the world upon him, and he's final sacrifice. These are more probably to look back as a memorial on that. It's going to happen during the millennial prophet period. And this is spoken of in other prophets as well, not just here. I know, difficult. Here's, the, here's what I want to say. Either we take the Bible as it is, as it comes across naturally in its context, or we just get rid of the meaning altogether, and it means nothing at all. The bottom line is this, though. In this case, the Lord wants his people to be pure and to serve him in a way that's pleasing to him. That's the bottom line in all generations. And he is pleased when people are living godly lives. He's pleased when people live godly lives in the day of Malachi. He was pleased that if, he, if they did that. And he will be pleased if we live godly lives in this day. And that holds true for any era. In this era, the Lord is seeking to constantly refine his people. He's always refining us. Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, whom God foreknew, he also predestined to, to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. The image of his son. And so the refiner wants to look down and see the image, his image reflected in our lives. That's what he wants to see. And so we have the Lord's forerunner, these four prophecies. Secondly, the Lord's coming. Thirdly, the Lord's refining. And lastly, the Lord's judgment, verse 5. Malachi 3, 5, then I'm going to draw to, near to you for judgment, he says. The day of the Lord will not only be a time of purifying, but of judgment as well. He's going to judge evildoers. Look at the verse. He's going to judge sorcerers, anybody involved in witchcraft, witchcraft incantations, the, the occult. He's going to judge the adulterers, those people who are immoral. He's going to judge those who swear falsely. They swear that a lie is the truth. They're going to be judged. He's going to judge those who oppress the less fortunate people, like if they oppress people who are not, they're not paying their workers for their labor, they're mistreating widows, they're mistreating orphans, they're withholding justice from foreigners. He's going to judge these people. He's going to especially judge those who have no fear of God. You know, I heard this week one of the candidates for president was saying, Beto O'Rourke said this. He said, they asked him a question about this, and he said, well, let me tell you something. If I'm president, if I become president, he said, the LBG, if the churches don't get in line with this and they don't start backing the LBGT, what, what is this, QTZ, XYZ, whatever they're called, community, he said, if they don't back gay marriage, then I'm going to withhold their, I'm going to pull their tax exemption status from them, he said. Translation, if they don't do my word, if they keep doing God's word instead of my word, I'm going to punish them for that. That's no fear of God. No fear of God. It reminds me of Revelation 21.8, which says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's going to be a dreadful day. Dreadful day. In the day of the Lord, there's going to be purification and judgment. I don't understand everything about this. I'm, trying, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. It, let me ask you this question as we close. Is it true that God approves evil? And takes the light and evil doers, as some claim in 2.17? Is that true? Of course not. Or else, why would he be judging people? 
And why are we right in questioning his justice? Like 217, where's the God of justice? Are we right in that? Of course not. He himself is the God of justice. He's never changed. He said a day when he's going to, justice is going to prevail. Our job is not to question the Lord at all. Not to question how he runs the universe. Our, our job is not to cast out on his holy character. Ours is not to weary him with foolish statements that reflect the heretical theology that we hear all the time. Ours is to submit to his authority. That's our job. Our job is to worship in, in righteousness. Jesus is coming again. And when he does, the world's going to know it. And many people are going to regret it. And I hope you can say tonight, my joy and my delight is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you can say that tonight. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are grateful again for your word. Pray that, you know, it's a, a word that tells us the truth as it is. Help us to take it seriously. Uh, help us to ponder what these things mean for us. We pray, Lord, most of all, we'll take great delight in the Lord Jesus Christ and love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We praise in Christ's name. Amen.